So before I get really mean, I just want to say that I love musicals and especially movie musicals. And I was really happy that a musical came out that wasn't a jukebox musical, wasn't based on anything, not even like a book, like fully original. With that said, The Greatest Showman is such a bizarre viewing experience. There are so many storytelling choices that don't go anywhere or don't make any sense. It's just a movie where nothing happens and no one really learns anything and there are no characters. A man starts a circus. That's it. If you're not really hyped to see a movie about a man starting a circus whose eventual legacy is financial ruin and public disgrace, then you're in for a rough ride. This movie is just a series of very weird and confusing choices. And I have made a numbered list. Weird thing number one, I honestly don't understand why this movie is about P.T. Barnum. So much has changed about his life story that it might as well be any other man. And given how Barnum is remembered today, it should have been any other man. Just a fictional man who starts a fictional circus with no historical baggage. So the opening scene is Hugh Jackman as P.T. Barnum and he's at a successful night at his beautiful circus and the opening song is like this edgy knockoff fallout boy song. And this musical number, your first impression, cold open, is what leads me to weird thing number two. Weird thing number two is that all the animals in this circus are CGI. Probably to save money, but also to draw your mind away from all those stories you've heard about how Barnum and Bailey Circus abused its animal performers. So obviously the elephants and the lions are CGI, but also the circus horses are CGI. Like they're just white horses. You have outdoor shots on like the set of a city street and there will be real horses pulling the carriages but inside the circus, it is CGI horses, and they do not look good. They're all gummy and rubbery, and in the opening sequence, you have this edgy Fallout Boy song, and while the drum is like beating, the horses are stomping in time to the drum beat. This was my first impression of the movie because this song is the first scene. Seeing this, honestly, I was like, I was here for it. Those horses are into this goth song. They're so fake. I was like, I was ready to enjoy the movie more than I've ever enjoyed any movie in my life. And uh, unfortunately, it was all downhill from there. Okay, bizarre thing number three is A Million Dreams. This is the second song in the movie, and I just wanted to make the whole song its own bullet point. I actually think it has a really nice melody, but this song is like the flashback song showing us Barnum's childhood. And his childhood is essentially that um, he was poor and suffered and was in love with a rich girl and wanted to start a circus. This song does that thing that musicals will do where it's not like a full reprise, but there will be a lull in the music and you'll have like a dialogue break and then the music will start again. And then, like I said, that's commonplace, but it does it like four times. I clocked it on my rewatch and this song spans 11 minutes of runtime in this movie. It reached a point where I started to wonder if this song would just be the rest of the movie. Like this is a musical with two songs, the opening song and a million dreams. The best part about this whole song is the part where 10 year old child P.T. Barnum fast forwards to adult Hugh Jackman P.T. Barnum because there are no intermediary stages. You just have young child and adult man Hugh Jackman. So there's a scene where P.T. Barnum's love has graduated school because they've just reached adulthood and P.T. Barnum goes up to her house to ask for her hand in marriage and it's Hugh Jackman. Like he rings the doorbell and it's, it's like 50 year old Hugh Jackman. Like, hello sir. I'm just a humble 25 year old shoe shiner here to ask for your daughter's hand. I looked it up and he's only nine years younger than the actor playing his father-in-law. So he and his love run away to the city to pursue their dreams. And now the song, it's still a million dreams. It picks up and they start doing this beautiful choreography with like lifts and jumps and high kicks. And I guess Hugh Jackman and Michelle Williams either couldn't do the choreography or didn't have time to learn it because suddenly there's a lot of fog and a lot of distant shots hanging sheets on clotheslines. You're seeing every part of these characters except their faces dancing this beautiful choreography. I mean, Zendaya was in this 
And they made her do most of the trapeze stuff. If I was her, I'd be mad. Number four, the freaks. First of all, I feel mean referring to the ensemble cast as the freaks, but uh, P.T. Barnum did it, and the movie said he was a great guy, so. The freaks were treated very strangely by this story. Let's look at the bearded lady first. P.T. Barnum is directed toward her by some random man on the street that's like, I know where you can find a freak. He goes inside like a, a factory, a textiles mill. Maybe it's a laundry house, but my point is that those hanging sheets of obscurity are back. And P.T. Barnum finds the bearded lady by following this very loud, very beautiful singing. Like it's a musical, but also in the world of the movie, the bearded lady is a beautiful singer, like in real life. And she just does gospel riffs at work constantly, I guess. So Barnum finds her and he can only see her eyes over this hanging sheet of laundry. And she's like, don't look at me. I'm hideous. But her eyes, which you can see, have these wonderfully applied false eyelashes. Like, well, she still made an effort when she got up this morning. He moves the sheet and she's she's got full beard, just the biggest beard ever. You're kind of like, well, gosh, if she hates the beard so much, trimming or shaving the beard are very real options. Like, no shame that you're a bearded lady. And if you're gonna own it, then own it. But if it's seriously making you that upset and your alternative is to hide your face behind a sheet all the time, then you could just shave your beard. I understand that it's a bummer to be a lady with stubble, but it's a world of difference from having like an eight inch long beard. And then we have General Tom Thumb and he's a dwarf and P.T. Barnum's like, if you join my freak show circus, no one's gonna point and laugh at you. They're gonna cheer. Except he's literally putting him in a freak show and in the circus scenes later, you do see the audience pointing and laughing, but like Tom Thumb's okay with it, so I guess it's fine. They have two Asian men there and they don't get dialogue or FaceTime. And I guess they're supposed to be the Siamese twins. They are not twins. They don't really look like each other. I think like one is Japanese and one is Korean. And they only kind of look like they're conjoined. Like they're always standing next to each other, but just kind of shoulder to shoulder. To be honest, they only ever look like two unrelated Asian men standing close to each other. I know that the conjoined twin demographic is extremely small, but I would imagine that Siamese twin is considered like a derogatory term for conjoined twins these days. It's at least kind of racially insensitive. It's just like the elephant in the room is that the movie really wanted to include the Siamese twins, but they were afraid to include the Siamese twins. Can I say elephant in the room when I'm talking about a circus movie? Like, was that confusing? Did you take me literally? There is an elephant in the room. It's CGI. It looks horrible. You have some background freaks. You have the world's heaviest man, tall Irish man, dog boy, albino with dreadlocks. And then you have Zendaya and her brother, and she's just like a hot lady that does trapeze. Even though every other featured character who's in the circus is a freak, then you just have Zendaya. And she's like othered because she's black and, you know, it's like the olden days. But it is kind of uncomfortable to see her lumped in with people with actual medical deformities when she's just a beautiful black woman. I also really like how Zendaya and her brother show up to apply for a job and they're like, no one's gonna wanna put us on the stage. We do trapeze. And you're like, first of all, you're not really selling yourself very well at this job interview. But secondly, how do you just casually pick up the trapeze? How can you be like an amateur trapeze-er? You can't really like practice at home, I think, Everyone that does the trapeze learned it at the circus that they worked at. The freaks are supposed to have this collective arc of like learning to love themselves, but there isn't really any progression to it. It's just a point A and point B situation. They have like three different musical numbers that start with, I'm afraid to be seen and end with, I love myself. And you don't really see what's changed their mind other than the fact that they're singing a song and dancing which do they know they're doing that? And they'll just arbitrarily move back and forth between these two extremes, just depending upon when the audience needs to be inspired, I guess. You never see them like coming together as a unit or honing their skills or practicing for the circus or anything because all of the actual circus shows are metaphorically represented in the meta narrative by these big musical dance numbers. 
And I assume that's not what the actual circus show is. It's just a representation of that event. Cause that would be like a really lame circus. I didn't come here to watch an albino break dance. I'm here to see a man hit a lion with a chair, okay? <laughs> or whatever you do with the circus. The weirdest scene for the freaks is when they get kicked out of this high society party. Okay, so one of the freaks says, we've been rejected our whole lives even by our parents. But for some reason, the bearded lady says that line. And like, you didn't have a beard when you were a baby. Why not have the conjoined twins say that line? Oh, it's because they're not allowed to speak, I forgot. Anyway, the bearded lady goes from, we've been rejected our whole lives and we just got kicked out of a party, to we gotta love who we are and not be afraid and I'm gonna dance through the streets. There's nothing to explain her change of heart or what has empowered her. The biggest thing I can say about a lot of these songs is that they don't feel like they're conveying story beats, they feel like they're dictating them. I guess I feel triumphant now because this is the part of the movie where the triumphant song goes. Number five, Jenny Lind. Jenny Lind is the most confusing and horrible part of the movie. So in real life, Jenny Lind is an extremely famous, accomplished Swedish opera singer, um, and she was known for being kind of a phenomenon, but one big part of her image was that she was a philanthropist, uh, she donated all of her wealth to charities, she was a very virtuous person, and she was kind of like Sweden's sweetheart, I guess. And she was hosted on an American tour by P.T. Barnum, which she ended early and amicably, but it was because she was uncomfortable with how much he commercialized the whole thing. He was auctioning tickets and stuff like that. So Jenny Lind in the movie. P.T. Barnum is at a party and he sees Jenny Lind and he's like, who's that? And immediately you're, he's gonna cheat on his wife alarms are going off. He sort of awkwardly flirts with her. She seems like she's into it. And then he signs her for the tour without ever having heard her sing. And then we flash forward in time to her first big performance. It's weird because the night of the performance, P.T. Barnum is like, I hope she can sing. And you're like, okay, in real life, I think it's true that he didn't hear her sing before he signed her. But in this, are we to assume that there were no like rehearsals in this venue? And in the time between booking her and actually having the performance, he still has not heard her sing? And I was like, oh, okay. The point of that contrivance is that she actually can't sing. That's why they went out of their way to establish that the bearded lady can sing. Jenny Lind is gonna be unable to perform, and then it's gonna be like, who's gonna sing for this sold out crowd? And then the bearded lady's gonna come out, she's gonna sing her This Is Real, This Is Me song, and then Jenny Lind comes out and starts singing, and I'm like, oh, never mind. I guess they do care about being historically accurate. So Jenny Lind sings a pop ballad, and that's weird because Jenny Lind is an opera singer and they've been telling us for the whole scene that she's an accomplished opera singer, but this is a very modern like Christina Aguilera type thing. But you're like, okay, this song that I'm hearing is happening in the meta narrative. In musicals, when characters sing, you understand they're not actually singing, but it's kind of weird because in the real narrative, she is actually singing. So it's weird that we're not just hearing the song that she's singing. In the narrative, she's on stage singing opera, but in the meta narrative that we're seeing, she's on stage singing a modern pop song. So that's odd, but what's really odd is that at this point, the movie just stops cold for us to hear like a four minute performance by a character that we've just met and don't know. And visually she's doing nothing more interesting than standing on a stage and singing a song. And every now and then it cuts back to the audience. The crowd loves her and I don't even get the point of us hearing her sing at all. They could have just cut past that scene. I was trying to make sense of this and I was like, okay, that must be a pop singer. Like, I don't recognize her face, but I'm gonna leave the theater and I'm gonna find out that she had like two number one singles this past year and she's a famous singer and this was like a cameo, an opportunity to hear a famous singer do a nice pop song that showcases her beautiful voice. Instead, when I went home, I looked it up and the lady they cast isn't even singing the song. They, they just hired a professional like session singer to do the vocals. 
And that's like 50% of Jenny Lynn's screen time. Like, why didn't the singer just, just be in the movie? And it gets worse. <laughs> it turns out that in this movie, the role of the Jenny Lind character is that she's a wicked seductress, here to tempt Hugh Jackman away from his freaks and his family. While they're on tour, she makes a pass at him, and then Barnum rejects her, and she calls off the tour in a jealous rage. And at the conclusion of her final performance, she summons him on stage to thank him, and then grabs him and forcibly kisses him, specifically out of spite, in like a bid to ruin his marriage or his reputation or something. This movie is so weird in so many ways. So when Jenny Lind kisses Barnum, they make a big point of having a bunch of people with cameras in the front row, and then the press is taking pictures of her kissing him, and you see these big old-timey flash bulbs going off to convey this fact. And then, when the newspaper comes out, we see the front page, and it's an artist's rendition. It's a sketch of P.T. Barnum kissing Jenny Lind. Like, what, the, what was the point of... This movie is so weird. I don't even know why the Jenny Lind character was in this. The only explanation that makes sense is that the writers had some kind of weird grudge and wanted to perform a mean-spirited character assassination against a woman who died in 1887. Number six, the songs. I already said how pleased I was that this musical is not a jukebox musical because I hate those, but here's the thing. This movie... It feels like it's a jukebox musical. All of these songs feel like they're written to be playable on the radio. Like the people writing them were too self-conscious to just unabashedly let them be about circuses and freak shows and stuff. This movie has nine original songs and I played them all back and listened to the lyrics to figure out which ones could not be divorced from the context of the musical. And, and it was two of them. The song The Greatest Show is about going to a show and enjoying it although not specifically a circus. That one only kind of counts, but I'm giving it a point to be generous. The song The Other Side is the most specific song. It is P.T. Barnum negotiating with the Zac Efron character to try to get him to sponsor his circus, and the back and forth dialogue between them plays out in song. It's very much like a musical-y song. I thought that was the best musical sequence in the movie because it was actually a song progressing the plot instead of the plot halting for a musical interlude. All the other songs sound like radio playable pop songs with extremely safe abstract lyrics. The other seven songs in the movie are about wanting to run away with somebody, living it up, wanting more in life, loving yourself, being in love with somebody you can't have, being betrayed by your partner, and living it up while loving yourself. And a lot of the lyrics are noticeably bad and anachronistic. There's one song, Come Alive, which in the movie I guess it's about Barnum saying that his circus is great, but if you listen to the lyrics, they're just about living large and taking risks. And that song has the lyric, like a zombie in a maze. You know, like people said in Victorian times. The songs even sound like they're lifted from popular artists. Like, I already said the opening song sounds like Fall Out Boy. The big Oscar bait song, This Is Me, sounds like something Pink would sing, like in that era after she started having kids and singing about optimism. The finale song sounds like Mumford and Sons, or worse, Philip Phillips. When I heard the Jenny Lynn song, I was like, man, this song reminds me of that TV show that was about a fake Marilyn Monroe musical. That TV show Smash? You know, in that show Marilyn Monroe was always singing those big pop ballads about fame and reaching for the top and always wanting more. This song's even about that. And then I got home and I found out that the guys that wrote all the songs for Smash wrote the songs for The Greatest Showman. I kind of wonder if that song was like a B-side they didn't have a chance to use in the show. You know, just pull that one out of the archives and blow the dust off. Number seven, P.T. Barnum is not a character. This is like the final nail in the coffin for me. Like, what skill does P.T. Barnum possess where we should be rooting for him? Like, is he especially charismatic? charismatic? No, because when he was first trying to market his museum, he was failing hard at that until his actual product improved and then it was doing the work for him. Is he a genius? 
No, most of his ideas come from happenstance. I feel like a lot of those movies where they show someone getting ideas do this, like you can't just think of an idea with your brain, you have to see it in your sight line. Like they just had that movie of Charles Dickens writing A Christmas Carol, and of course he can't just have the idea of Scrooge, he has to see an old man with a crazy top hat and go, a top hat? By Jove, I'll put that in my story! That's not what he talks like as far as I know. There's this wonderfully baffling moment in A Million Dreams where he's a little boy starving on the street and he's huddled in an alley and a hand comes down and it gives him an apple and he's like, an apple! And he looks up and the person handing him the apple is a freak. Remember, that's Barnum's word, not mine. She has some kind of physical deformity. You're like, oh, this really unlikely happenstance will give him an affinity for freaks and later inspire him to start a freak show. But that's not what happens. Later, as an adult, he happens to see a dwarf in the bank when he's applying for a loan. And that still doesn't give him the idea for the freak show. His first business venture is a museum of weird things, and that does horribly. The freak show thing ends up being his young daughter's idea, so I don't know why they had the scene with the apple since it didn't influence his ideas later in life at all. He doesn't even have the idea to call his show a circus. Like, a mean critic calls it a circus, and he goes, I like that word. Like, can this man do anything for himself? And I mean, he's not a shrewd businessman either. You have this whole montage of him selling out freak shows night after night, and then it's later revealed that he's somehow still horribly in debt. Like, he never paid off his startup loan for the freak show. And then you have Jenny Lind, and she's selling out her whole tour, he's making bank off that, but then his circus burns down and he's like, there's nothing I can do, I have nothing. And you're like, where'd you put your money, old man? You don't really see him bonding or interacting with the freaks after he initially hires them. If anything, the extent of their interactions is like one of them is hiding behind the curtain and they're like, I can't go out there. Barnum offers some super lethargic advice like, no, they're gonna love you, listen to them. They're cheering or something. There's no real relationship built up between them. And he drops them like a ton of bricks as soon as he signs Jenny Lind and he has a more legitimate act. There's a scene where they're like some evil thugs and they're, they're trying to beat up the freaks. P.T. Barnum pokes his head out the side door and he's like, hey, don't beat on my freaks. That's about as much as you get out of him. He seems like he's attracted to Jenny Lind when you first see him. And like, at least that would be something to go off of for his character. But then he turns her down. He's not even interesting enough to actually cheat on his wife. He's just slimy enough to think about it. And until he rejects Jenny, you don't know what he's gonna do. And when he rejects her, you don't know why he did that. Because you don't know anything about him. He just goes through every scene with the same bland, indecipherable smirk on his face. The mean critic character goes, your show is all fake. And you think P.T. Barnum's going to be like, what the hell are you talking about? The movie hasn't shown anything fake in my show. I got a real bearded lady. I got a real dwarf. I got two real Asian men that might be conjoined. But instead he does that same half smirk and he's like, well... If people are entertained, who's to say what's real and what's not? Like, that's nice, but the movie hasn't shown us any fake acts, so it doesn't make any sense to us. But the movie acts like he just had the last word and his comeback was great, so good for him. You guys know P.T. Barnum is dead, right? Like, you can give him some relatable flaws. He's not gonna like drive to your house. Number eight, the love story. This movie had a love story and it feels unfair to even call it a B plot. They have Zac Efron and Zendaya in love, but they don't really have any like dialogue between them. And they don't acknowledge that that's a thing that's going on until the movie's already like halfway over. And at that point, you don't really know anything about Zendaya other than that she does the trapeze. But this story is so weird in how it's approached, like, they're in love, I guess. They fell in love off camera, okay. But because they're different races, Zac Efron is afraid to commit to an actual relationship with her because he's like embarrassed to be seen with her. Then Zendaya is upset because he's being hot and cold and it's insulting that he won't want to be with her. But then Zendaya takes part in that group dance number about loving yourself and being who you are. And she dances angrily like towards Zac Efron and he sees it and he has a change of heart. Or I mean, I guess he does because the next time they have a scene together, he's like, I don't care what society thinks. I want to be with you because now Zendaya is the one with reservations and it feels 
pretty understandable. She feels uncomfortable knowing that if she allows him to be with her, she's like letting him ruin his life and lose his inheritance and they get all these uncomfortable stares everywhere they go. And she has to be afraid of like actual violence because that's the time period they're in. But then he sings a romantic song to her about, I wanna be with you and what are you afraid of? Why are you holding back? And, and I'm just like, I, I get why she's holding back. It's reasonable. But then the narrative punishes Zendaya for her wariness over this. They straight up punish her by having Zac Efron almost die in a fire. So she has to sit penitent weeping at his bedside, regretting that she didn't love him when she had the chance. And she was wrong to care what people thought. And you're like, ah, oh, she's in a marginalized racial group. I think deciding not to care what people think is maybe a luxury she doesn't have. The whole fire scene was really funny because there was this contrived sequence of like character A being like, where's character B? And running into the fire. And then character B runs out of the fire like, where's character A? And then character C has to run in to save them. And you're treated to a shot of Hugh Jackman actually bridal carrying Zac Efron out of the burning building. That's all I really wanted. But that's pretty much the only nice thing I can say about that. Number nine, none of these characters are actually characters and this story has no story. Okay, here are the characters who have any flaws at all. Jenny Lind, who is an evil seductress. The nameless racist mob who set fire to the theater. Zac Efron, who's temporarily ashamed of his girlfriend because his parents are racist. And Zendaya, who is cruel and superficial for not wanting to date a white man in 1852. Everybody else in the story story is perfect and talented and they sing anthems about being themselves. I already said P.T. Barnum was a poor choice for an upbeat pop musical. I mean, he was basically just a pretty awful guy and if you really show all of his flaws, no one's gonna want to see a story about him anymore. But you could always handpick like a few to give him some kind of depth, you have a lot to choose from. Just decide which ones you want to acknowledge and tackle within the narrative. Or imagine if they reframed this story and made the freaks the main characters, or even just one of them and their particular relationship with Barnum. His real life relationship with General Tom Thumb was genuinely really interesting. Like, he, he saw him as a kid, he recruited him, he was lying about his age to try to make his smallness seem even weirder. He set him up with a female dwarf and he commodified that too. He's, he sold tickets and he was inviting the public to like speculate about their sexual relationship and laugh at the idea that dwarves could have that. He got a dwarf who hated Tom Thumb and I think actually like punched him in the face one time to be the best man just because he was another dwarf and Barnum thought it would look funnier if they were all short. And he called it the fairy wedding, like, ooh, look, they're so small. But on the other hand, for Tom Thumb, his real name was Charles. Charles knew Barnum for most of his life and he did end up becoming highly respected, not just as like a freak show component, but as an actor and a performer. This was really by virtue of his own natural talent and kind of in spite of the way Barnum marketed him. But the way he saw it, Barnum was this benefactor and this man who gave him a wonderful opportunity. He became extremely wealthy and he considered Barnum such a friend that he even like bailed him out one of the many times that Barnum was flat broke because he was always irresponsible with his money. So to Charles, it was like, yeah, that's my lifelong friend. In the movie, Tom Thumb has like six or seven lines and the one with the most personality is when he calls Queen Victoria sweetheart as like comic relief, I guess. The thing is people's relationships can be complex and we as outsiders might be like, that was a really bad relationship, but to the people inside of it, it can seem different and there are like nuances to it. P.T. Barnum might have looked at Charles as an attraction for his shows or an object that he could market. His relationships with the freaks in his freak show, some of whom were literally slaves that he literally owned was a little more like the relationship people have with their pets than like a healthy human relationship between equals. And he generally treated them very poorly, but he also traveled with them and probably knew them really well. And some of these people were used to poor treatment, even from their families. They might've really felt like he made their lives better. I would imagine they were kind of constantly torn between wanting to see the best in this colleague that they had and that they'd known forever and realizing on some level 
the way he regarded them as less than human. Like the circus and the financial independence it afforded them was liberating, but the show itself was cruel and demeaning. I don't know, that sounds like a situation that would result in a lot of complex emotions. Like, maybe that you could explore through song. But instead this movie just treats the freaks as a collective entity, and they're just like, girl power, born this way, whatever, just knockoffs of every empowering anthem that's been on the radio in the last five years. And instead of any kind of nuanced story, they're just learning the same lesson over and over about loving yourself and not letting people belittle you, even when you're actively letting an able-bodied man sell tickets to rich people so they can come and gawk at your weird deformities. And P.T. Barnum is an inspiring genius who loves fancy and imagination. He's a family man and the selfless liberator of freaks. And in the last 10 minutes of the movie, he's like, let's put the circus in a tent. And it's the first original idea we've literally seen him have in the entire movie. It doesn't help that that weird lopsided half smirk is actually the default expression Hugh Jackman has for this entire film. Just the slanted open mouth smirk. My best guess for this face is it's not a character choice. It's just that Hugh Jackman really loves being in musicals and he can't help but smile and he doesn't realize his face is doing that. Seriously, if you did a drinking game with this movie and the only rule was to drink every time his face looks like this, you would get very drunk and you wouldn't need any other rules. Number 10, this movie ends with P.T. Barnum going to reconcile with his family and he goes there by riding a big CGI elephant through the streets. This movie is so dumb. This movie seriously had so many characters, you guys, I didn't even know what to cover. You know how Infinity War is gonna have like 87 superheroes and everyone's preemptively making fun of it? Like, oh, they're gonna have like 40 seconds of screen time each. That's what it felt like this movie was dealing with. Like the critic who's writing about his show in the paper is supposed to be a character. Hugh Jackman's daughter has a subplot about learning ballet and the other girls make fun of her and say she's a clown girl that smells like peanuts. And it never comes back. Like, oh my God, why did it get so much screen time? When you go to see Infinity War, load up on your phone, like the soundtrack of one of the seasons of Glee and make believe that you've never heard of any of the superheroes before. And it'll basically be like you saw this movie.